Uh, okay, so we're going to do two, um, two talks for you uh, today. I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Meg Schwamm, uh, first of all, um, who's going to talk to you about mysteries of the solar system and how citizen scientists can make an impact there. So Meg is, uh, she's a lecturer at, at Queen's in the, in the Astrophysics Research Center. Uh, she did her PhD at Caltech in California. Uh, and then she moved to Yale as a, as a postdoctoral scientist in Yale. She spent some time in Taiwan uh, as well as a, as a postdoctoral researcher. And then she went to Hawaii um, to the observatory called Gemini. Uh, and the Gemini, teles Gemini uh, system runs two telescopes. Uh, one runs one in, it's a twin telescope system. One is in Hawaii and one is in Chile. They cover both hemispheres. Um, it's on top of the mountain in Hawaii, 4,000 uh, meters um, altitude. Uh, and Meg was one of the staff scientists in Gemini. And then we managed to attract her to, uh, to Queens to, uh, to come to work as a lecturer here several years ago. So I will introduce Meg first, and then I'll talk to you afterwards. Good morning. So today I'm going to be talking to you about really working with 150,000 collaborators. And I mean that when I say 150,000 people. So I study Mars. I also study planets around other stars. Uh, I study bodies in our solar system. But what I want to talk today is about Mars. Um, and so a lot of times when you think about the red planet, you probably think of this thing. You think of an emo rover taking selfies, looking for water, or the signs of potential life or past life on Mars. What I want to think about today and what I try to study is how Mars is so alien compared to the Earth. And so this is showing a snapshot of the south pole of Mars and the permanent ice cap there. And so unlike the poles in our solar system, or rather in our Earth, um, this is made of carbon dioxide ice, which goes straight from solid to gas. And so what's really interesting and exciting is that this doesn't happen on Earth at all. This is a process totally alien in the sense that, yes, we do have carbon dioxide. You can get dry ice. But we don't see it on this mass scale. 30% of the Martian atmosphere condenses out onto the winter pole of the planet to form a temporary carbon dioxide ice sheet. And so when you get to the spring and summer of that pole, and so this case we're looking at the South Pole, and that's the permanent cap, but on top of that as, as well is that temporary ice sheet. And what you see is if you can image that ice sheet over the spring and summer when the sun is finally up after darkness, you start seeing these dark splotches and streaks on the surface. So these things that start to appear. And so what's actually happening, we think, is that we're seeing carbon dioxide jets, or geysers, or geysers, coming up, breaking through the ice. So I wouldn't want to be standing on the South Pole of Mars when this is happening. What we think is that the sun comes up, you heat the soil, the ice is semi-translucent, it's about a meter thick, and so it heats the soil, and now you've got warm soil and ice, and you get a layer of trapped carbon dioxide ice that, that basically sublimates and creates a gas. And so it breaks through, right, because it wants to get back into equilibrium with the atmosphere, shattering any cracks in the ice, bringing up dust and dirt with it. And so this is what we think is happening. We think we are seeing the signs of the wind blowing the material that's just lifted up to the surface by those carbon dioxide jets in the spring and summer. And if there's wind, it blows them into these beautiful sort of fans. You can kind of see the ones this image kind of look like that they're sort of bifurcated, there might be two wind directions. And that if there's no wind, that maybe that's when we see those sort of ellipses or sort of circles, or we call them blotches informally, on the surface. And so you could think of each one of these little points as their own wind sock telling you the surface wind direction. And that's really important because that's the thing you use to determine weather, right? This is the hardest thing to get right, that interaction between the atmosphere and the surface. And so if we can measure the hundreds of thousands of these little fans and hundreds of thousands of images of Mars' South Pole over multiple years, we can create the largest wind map on another planet. 
And just like you knew it was going to rain today by looking at your phone, right? it's because so much data has gone into the climate models that drive the weather predictions, right? that it's pretty good now to about the half hour of whether it's going to rain or not. So with that, the idea being of those observations, right? if we could make those measurements, what could we see? Well, the beauty is that we have the ability to look at this because of the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter and the high rays camera, which is the highest resolution camera ever sent to another world. And so it can see about that table size of a boulder on the surface. And so all these little blue dots here are regions that have been monitored by high rise and Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter for multiple years. And so we have the data set to be able to create this wind map if we could only map them. And I want to drive the point of why this is important is that it tells us about the Martian climate. So you'll see that there's two images of roughly the same area of Mars taken with high rise at about the same time of year. And they look different. Looks like there's a lot more stuff on season two. And what happened between season one, when Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter arrived, and season two is a global dust storm. And so the entire Martian atmosphere was filled with dust. You couldn't see down to the surface. And that dust was being placed into the forming ice sheet as carbon dioxide snow was falling down on the south pole of Mars. And so this image on the right, or rather, the left is come my left is coming from the season after that that event and so we know that there's something different about that ice sheet than the previous season and so by mapping these fans and getting the wind directions we can start to figure out how those big global events tie into the martian climate and that's really important if you want to send people to mars we don't want to have a thing like the Mar you know we don't want to have the scenario that's in the you know the the movie The Martian. We want to know when there's going to be a dangerous storm that's going to come and possibly be a threat to a crewed mission. And so every little bit that we can understand about the Martian atmosphere ties back into modeling that to do just as good of predictions there that we can do on the Earth. OK, so how can we do this? So my pitch is, this is incredibly difficult, but you're probably looking at it go, it's not. And so, like Earth, Mars has textures and colors. And so it's really easy by eye to spot these. It's incredibly difficult to tell a computer how to do it. So, especially when the dynamic range and the colors change. But while I'm talking, you've probably already identified all the fans and blotches in the image. And so that's the point, is that we've tried computer algorithms. They continue to fail. but. Right. On average, at least, and maybe more, right, of, of people spend about three or five hours a day, or three or five hours a week on social media, some more. There's a statistic in the US that uh, most Americans spend at least 30 minutes a day on Facebook. If you could tap into that brain power at just a few percent, imagine what you can do, because with the internet, we're all connected. And so if you can break a research problem down to something that you can easily do on the web, you can tap into that brain power. And that's part of what we've done, is asking people to help us explore Mars from the comfort of Earth. And so with the internet, you can reach everybody that has an internet connection. And with the Zooniverse, and so if you're bored of my talk, just go on your phone and go look at the Zooniverse, because they are a platform that enables scientists to be able to ask the public to help them do science and help us do the problems we can't solve ourselves. Because if I tried to map all those fans and blotches, it would take me more than 20 years. But if everybody could do a little bit, then we can get there. And so the idea is the wisdom of crowds. And you know this effect, because if you've seen any game show where they ask the crowd what the answer is and you look at the poll, the majority usually gets the vote right. And so the Zooniverse has created this platform where you can enlist the public, connects them with researchers to solve research problems by sifting through the data. And if we take the collective response, 
right, we get often outperforming the expert and the machine learning algorithms that we have to date. And so basically it's that wisdom of the crowd, taking so many non-expert opinions and combining it, and that's where the power is. And so I'm part of the Planet 4 team where we are asking people to help us map those seasonal fans and blotches. And so I'll just give you a quick taste of it, see if that works. So what you do is you go to planet4.org. When we have data, we're out at the moment, but we will have some soon. And we ask people to map either an ice cream, ice cream cone shape or an ellipse. And so using those two shapes, we ask about 30 people to look each at each image, and we combine the results together. And so this is showing you the proof that is really in the pudding. So here we're showing at the top, uh, it's got the tile, it's empty, we have all the fan markings, then we have all the blotch markings, and so the idea is we combine them together. And so it's really the a combined assessment from every volunteer that goes into identifying that. So it boils down to having a fan catalog and a blotch catalog for each dark feature on the surface that is fr from that jet process. And then based on how many Fans are, you know, how many people marked a fan versus how many people marked a blotch determines what it is. So if most people say it's a fan, it ends up being a fan in our catalog. And so we've done this for thousands of tiles or sub-images from Planet 4 that are, are really chunks of the bigger high-rise images. And so what we've been able to do with our 150,000 collaborators is create the largest wind map on Mars. And so now we get to explore what does that mean from season to season. So my right, your left, um, you'll see that there's, there's lots of plots. But the sort of the, my right is early spring. Then we have my left is late spring. And so on the top, we have season two and season three. And all I want you to get out of this plot is that we're showing the orientation of the measured fans. And so each color is a different image or effectively a different time in that season. And so you can think of early spring, they do kind of line up roughly, but the direction totally changes in late spring. So we can show that the wind actually has changed because the fan directions have changed. And those old fans, if they were still around, would have been still in those later images. So it's not that our volunteers didn't mark them, they don't exist. So they went away. And that's telling us something. We think the particles are actually sinking into the ice because we don't have another explanation for where they went. And so with all of these people helping us, we've been able to really understand and explore Mars. And look at the diversity of the region. So this is showing the same kind of plot for a different region. If you notice, we dubbed them different names of cities. I need to get a Belfast on there. It's on my list. <laughs> I, I promise I will get on that. And so here you saw Manhattan. This is Inca City. And so you can just see that that looks very different from Manhattan. right? In late spring, it's in every direction. And that might make sense when you look at, at Inca City is that there's lots of different sort of polygonal ridges where you have lots of different angles of, of relief. And so it might make sense that we're seeing fans in all different directions because topography matters more here than it does in Manhattan. And so now we can actually start doing this comparison of climate and weather we couldn't do before. And so I'll end by talking about sort of bringing it back to those weather measurements, right? So we think this is wind, but can we prove it's wind? And the answer is, is yes. And so this is showing so it's just sort of topography, but all the little red dots are the regions we have wind measure, we think are wind measurements for, for planet four, from planet four. And so these sort of dashed dotted lines are the grid, high resolution grids from a weather model that's taking basically an engine that is derived from how we develop weather models for the Earth, including whether a hurricane's going to hit a certain city, whether it's going to rain in Belfast, ripping out the bits that don't work for Mars, and then writing in new modules that account for the physics of the Martian atmosphere, of everything we think we know it's doing, including the rough topography. 
And so our high resolution images have, are much better resolution than topography than what's sort of plotted in this, these plots. But that's the input that goes into the weather model. And from what we now know, comparing all the little wind socks that, we've, that our collaborators, the 150,000 people who've helped us, what we can say is that they, do, they match. So here's showing all the locations we have wind measurements for and sort of doing a traffic light system. So green means it matched in terms of direction to what the model predicted. Red means it doesn't. Yellow means it partially matches. And blue means we didn't have enough data. There was only one observation, so we didn't have enough data over time to tell us. And so the real point is that we can show that really the broad topography, the big sort of rolling hills and valleys, is what's driving the wind on the South Pole of Mars. And it matches incredibly well with the directions we're getting from Planet 4. And so this is the first real measurement and test of these weather models from the, at the ground layer. We have so much more data to go through. We've had two full seasons ma mapped and studied. We have a, one more from the initial uh, first year of the high-rise mission to go through, and many more years of data to look at this in the long baseline. And so really, it's been people on Earth that have driven all of this research. And we couldn't have done it without all, all of you who might be looking at our site now, people have done it before, and again, those that will continue to help us. And so I really do mean that it's 150,000 Earthlings that have really explored Mars from the comfort of home. And so I'll just give a quick update of the project, which is that we launched our new version on the New Zooniverse platform, and that, again, I've continued to build more projects, including one that is data. So if you don't like Mars, I have other projects for you, <laughs> including if you'd like to go find an extrasolar planet, feel free. You can go to ngts.planethunters.org, and that's our latest project that I've launched with other researchers at Queens. So go explore the universe. If you don't, aren't excited about space, go count penguins or... <laughs> Animals in the Serengeti, there's lots of things to do in the Zooniverse, so I hope you'll dive in. So we've got some time for questions. We were going to plan a 15-minute uh, discussion session after I talk, but I'll, I'll, we'll take questions now on, on this. Um, one thing I, I was struck by uh, listening to this, it's a... You know, it's, it's, a, it's a project for and by humanity. You know, you're, you're measuring the, the environmental conditions, the wind conditions on another planet that we might visit one day, or some human might visit one day, and humanity is helping that effort by exploring the planet right now. So two questions, three questions in fact related. Um, can we go to Mars? Should we go to Mars? And when do you think people will go to Mars? <laughs> Oh, detail questions. Um, yes, we should go to Mars. I don't think everybody should go to Mars. I worry about uh, space tourism. So why I worry about Elon Musk is maybe my big worry. Yes, I think we should explore other worlds, but I worry about preserving Mars, right? Because we, the only planet we, could, we know of that is life on right now is us. Mars possibly could have in the past. And so I worry about having space tourists trampling all over Mars when we haven't yet studied it. Because our best planetary or exoplanetary system we'll ever study is our own. And so I want to find a way that everybody can be happy. right? And so we can go study, have people, human beings, visit the, those worlds, but also do it in a way that we don't ruin it for future generations. right? So I don't know. I'm, I think we'll do it. I think it's going to happen and you know, maybe not my, my lifetime, I hope it does, but I think it depends on how all the governments work together um, and whether uh, it's going to be uh, SpaceX that gets there first before uh, ESA or a, a ESA, you know, NASA joint mission. So it's my complicated answer to that question. So we'll take a few questions before my talk. Um, my, uh, my question is about The Martian, the film you mentioned. Um, so. My understanding is that Andy Weir, you know, is a science nerd, so he was very keen to get everything very scientifically accurate, except 
he made one compromise for plot reasons, which is the storm you mentioned. And from what I've read, the understanding is that because the atmosphere is so thin, the wind actually wouldn't be, wouldn't be that, um, wouldn't feel that strong, even if the, the speed of the, uh, of the atmosphere, the wind was, was very, very high. Is that, is that true? I think it depends a little bit. Um, I mean, I think as global dust storms tend to obscure everything. And so I think I, my worry would be is you kill spacecraft that way. So if you're, everything is powered <laughs> right by solar, a, solar a, a global dust storm then puts you know, humans at risk. But also there's um, more local dust storms that again can put more dust around, which then can, can do things. So yeah, the wind speeds were sort of upped to, to create the, the situation that was needed. But still, I think even dust storms in general are still a worry for all NASA spacecraft um, and, and ESA, future ESA missions um, you know, on the ground. So, so I, but I also think it's you know, also understanding what's happening in terms of the pressures and um, understanding, again, if you're going to use the Martian atmosphere to generate fuel, right, which is one scenario, making sure you understand what you're doing when you know, there's a big, there's a huge swing in pressure. It's, it's, it was measured in the Viking era, right? And so that doesn't happen on Earth and understanding what the effect of that is gonna be on human beings if there, we have a base there. So I think it has all that kind of context, but yeah, I wouldn't be as worried necessarily of, of, of humans being on Mars and, and you know, not surviving a dust storm. I think they would, it would just be you know, like one of the sandstorms. Thank you for your talk. Is it in any way feasible to um, use um, frozen carbon dioxide as a way of removing carbon dioxide from our own atmosphere? Really the best way on Earth to bury carbon dioxide is again using the oceans and really making it rock. Um, so the ice isn't gonna be helpful, but there are ideas of carbon dioxide scrubbers that would condense it, right? So into basically, into some, you know, using the known chemical reactions that we know can form rocks that, you know, basically take in carbon dioxide or incorporate that into the, the, the molecular structure. So I think that's the way people want to go with, with thinking about how do you sequester um, carbon dioxide in our own atmosphere if human beings can't figure out how to do it, in a, or rather, figure out how to deal with the climate crisis you know, um, so that we don't have to build that, right? Which is trees are the best, actually, carbon dioxide scrubber. So it's actually, you know, in some sense, better to be doing that um, and reforesting than necessarily trying to build these kind of scrubbers because you have to bury it and the best place would probably be in the oceans. But again, everything sort of has its own impact, so. I think even at the poles, it's, it's too warm. For carbon dioxide, it would it would sublimate even if you you know if you put carbon dioxide there, it would sublimate and vaporize e even at the poles. So it's just not cold enough here. Thank you, Meg, for your absolutely fascinating talk, and I loved your images. You opened by saying that at the south pole of Mars, uh, the white we could see was carbon dioxide ice. Um, how do we know it's carbon dioxide ice? How was that discovered? Ah, so there's a huge flotilla of spacecraft that have orbited Mars since the 70s. Um, and so they actually have uh, spectrographs on board, and so they've actually measured the, the, the composition. So we see the signature of carbon dioxide ice, and we can actually measure the temperature of it, and it's at the temperature of carbon dioxide ice that you'd expect given the pressure of the, of the atmosphere. So it's from that that we infer that it's carbon dioxide ice. One more here. So um, I think it's Elon Musk uh, and others who sort of put forward this idea that Mars could be this backup plan, this fallback option if we sort of so-called so destroy the planet. Uh, but my intuition is that even if we had crazy runaway climate change, we're way, way worse than the IPCC worst scenario, or even if we had a nuclear war, the Earth would be more, more Mars would be more hospitable to human life than, than Earth, or terraforming or fixing the Earth would still be cheaper and more achievable than, is my intuition wrong on that? I think your intuition's right. I think also we're not at a state where we could terraform any planet. So if you wanna do it in the next 100 years, I don't know if we're gonna have the technology to do that. 
And if we can't, we can't fully, like, we can't fully model the climate of Mars that we're getting data to test that. I'm not sure in 50 years we're going to be at a point where we're going to want to start messing with an atmosphere and figure out what it actually does. So I think as we got to figure out Earth, that the backup plan needs to be there isn't a backup plan. We got to fix Earth, right? Because also we're going to just keep doing it. So you know, and Mars is smaller. So or are we sending all of Earth to Mars, or is it just going to be the rich people that can pay to get onto SpaceX to go and live their life there? Well, the rest of humanity suffers. And so I think we shouldn't try to make a tiered system of society and say, well, the backup plan is for those people. And so I think figuring out fixing Earth, which we know way more about and way more about its climate, is the first thing we should do, rather than investing in technology that's not going to get there, which we know what to do to fix this. Like, there are clear things that actions that can be put into place. And so I think starting with that's going to be the best point. But yeah, I think even, even you know, Earth's worst bad day uh, is, you know, with the climate crisis, is still going to look better than Mars, particularly that it doesn't have an atmosphere you can breathe. So <laughs> feel free, you know, you can't take your, your helmet off <laughs> and go sip a cup of coffee. You're going to die really quickly. So, you know, I think, you know, figuring out how you, you thicken that atmosphere, right, is a lot of, of, it's a big science experiment, and I'm not sure we want to risk lives making sure we know what to do. Thanks, Meg. I, Meg, I completely agree. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm going to give you a, 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 a quick talk now, uh, and then we'll come back to some, uh, some questions afterwards. Thank you, Mick. Um, this comes at a good time, because we've just developed a, a project. i um, done this with uh, the artist Oliver Jeffers that some of you um, may know. So I'm going to talk mostly about art and science and how that can both inform science but also, and how um, scientific achievement is inspired by art, um, uh, but also how we can communicate science and scientific uh, results to the broader uh, community um, through artistic projects and help enhance the scientific understanding of our, uh, of our population through, through these artistic projects. And I've, I've learned a lot in the last year uh, doing this uh, project with, with Oliver Jeffers. Um, so artist Oliver is a, uh, most, he's been mostly a, a children's artist. He's written books that frames uh, humanity and humanity's problems in simple ways from the view of the broader view of the cosmos. Uh, so what we've designed is a, is a scale model of the solar system. It's here in Belfast. I'm not sure if you're going to get a chance to see it. It's on the top of Divis Mountain at the minute. There, there's two other opportunities to see this. It's an exact scale model of the solar system. It's 1 to 591 million to 1. And I'm, going to I'm going to explain it here. So the, 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 the reason we built it is that that number sort of does. It's a big number, but it doesn't really make, you, know, you, can't get, you can't grasp it. So let me see if I, if I, if I can, if I can exp explain simply what they give you an idea of the scale of the solar system, our galaxy, and then the galaxies beyond it. Um, so Oliver had this idea when we come up with a project. Um, he had wanted to do this for a while. Um, and the problem, as you'll see, in building a scale model of the solar system to try and communicate how far away Mars is, what size Mars actually is, as you've heard about, very interesting measurements on the surface of the planet. But where is it? How big is it? What is the, what is the scale of our solar system in the broader uh, context? And what is our position? What is our view of humanity within that uh, context? So this is all now on the top of, of Divis Mountain. Um, it's... We designed it so that to walk between the sun and Pluto was 10 kilometers. So it's a, it's, it's a trail. It's a walking trail that you can go. You can see and you can feel the, the size of the planets. There's Uranus there. So Oliver designed these big colorful arches because, as you'll see, the planets are tiny in comparison to the distances between them. His view was, and his, his over, one of his overall arching themes was, with distance comes perspective. And I'll explain what, he, what, uh, what, we, what we meant by that. It was in Derry for, uh, for four weeks on the, the banks of the, of the River Foyle. Uh, very popular uh, in Derry, just lots of people turned up. And the thing about it is, just go and do it. You just go and you walk and you, and you get a feel, a natural feel for uh, the scales involved. So it's, not, it's going to be on the top of Divis Mountain here. It's free, of course, you can go anytime, 24, it's open 24 hours. 
Um, it's going to, we're going to take it to Cambridge. If any of you live in the south of England in that area and you want to go and see it, it's going to go to Cambridge in mid-July to mid-August uh, along the banks of the, of the River Cam. And then it will come back here to the North Down Coastal Path uh, for four weeks um, from about mid-September. And we're hoping that we'll get um, permanent or semi-permanent permission for it to for it to, uh, to be there along the, along the coastal path. So let me try and explain it a bit here in this room. Um, and that's a little sketch, Oliver's uh, a sketch of the, uh, of the trail. So who, who's actually heard of Oliver Jeffers or, or has seen his, have read or seen his books probably as children or with your children? Um, this is Oliver's sketch of the, of the solar system on the top of Divis Mountain. You start at the sun, and there's the arches of the inner planets, and it goes right the way around to Pluto. So we did put Pluto there. It is a, it is a, it's a dwarf planet, uh, now defined, and there are several dwarf planets beyond Pluto. Uh, so we, 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 we put it there because it certainly does, it does exist. It's not classified as one of the planets now, but um, uh, I think it, people feel that it's certainly still part of our solar system. So let me give you an idea. So there's the, here's a picture of the sun taken by NASA's Solar uh, Dynamics Observatory. Um, and that's about, and I just scaled it there before, that's about 2.3 meters across. And that's the size of the sun, exact, the size of the sun on Divis. I don't know if that's exactly 2.3 meters, but I just roughly scaled it here to give you an idea. And so on, on Divis, uh, on the, the actual sculpture trail, there's a, there's a big sculpture of the sun, which is 2.3 meters in size. So the Earth, in comparison to that, so you can go and see the full 3D uh, uh, sculpture on Divis, but the Earth, in comparison to that, is this two centimeter sphere, and that would be 400 meters away. Okay, so this this is about you know, 30 meters to the top of the of the lecture, of the of the theater here, maybe 40 meters from here. So so 10 times the size of this. Uh, this lecture theater, um, and the Earth uh, would be would be there, so pretty far away and small. The Earth's about a hundredth the size of uh, of the Sun, and so Pluto, the size of our solar system, the edge, which is not quite the edge of our solar system, but Pluto, then the size of Pluto, is this little crystal ball. I bought these crystals in uh, a shop in Malaga, uh, and the guy didn't didn't know who I was, so he, he sold me crystals, but he told me he was going to clean the crystals for me, and he dinked, dinked them off the side of a, and he told me this in Spanish, so he dinked them off the side of a, uh, of a bowl that he had and sold, sold me the crystals and told me they were clean. I said, oh, thank you very much, and I'm very relieved. <laughs> so here it is Pluto, it's a little amber ball, it's four millimeters in size, and Pluto on this, the scale of our solar system, with the Earth being two centimeters, Pluto is four millimeters, and that's 10 kilometers away from here, and that's the edge of the solar system. If you can see that little tiny ball, four, so it's a four um, millimeter. So it's, it's, it's quite underwhelming if you do the whole trail and you walk 10 kilometers and you come up and that's what you end up at. <laughs> and Oliver's left a little message for you, but I won't tell you what it is. You'll have to walk the trail to, uh, to see what he's written, uh, written beside, the, beside Pluto. Um, so space is mostly empty space. That's really the, uh, that's really the message behind the uh, behind the, the, the trail, um, and, and Oliver's uh, our message, not just not just the scientific message of trying to explain these the scale of the solar system. The problem is, as you, as you you can understand now, building a model to explain that is that the distances between the planets are much larger than the than the objects themselves. So, if the, we to give you then a scale, so that's our solar system. Um, our galaxy, that's, that's, just our, that's just our solar system. The edge of the, so the real edge of the solar system is, another twi is about twice the distance uh, from Pluto, um, where we would define an, uh, the, the, the edge of our solar system, which is the, uh, the edge of the heliosphere, which the Voyager spacecraft has left. That's about twice the distance. There's another, uh, there's another area in our solar system called the Oort cloud, which is even further than that. That's Hypothetical, contains most of the comets, we think, in, in our solar system. Um, but what about the distance to the next star? So between our solar system and the next star, on this scale, where the sun is this size that, uh, that I showed you, uh, then the distance to the next star is about five times the radius of the Earth on this scale. 
uh, and the distance, the size of our galaxy, if we look, could look at our galaxy, um, that's how our galaxy could look if we could look down on it. It's not our galaxy, of course. It's, a, it's, a, it's M61 in the Virgo cluster, but our galaxy would look exactly like that. And on that scale, the galaxy would be at the real distance of Jupiter. Um, and our galaxy is only one of... And in our galaxy, there are about 100 billion stars, and our galaxy is only one of about 100 billion galaxies in the universe. So space is pretty big. And that's, that's one of the ideas we, we wanted to convey with this, um, uh, with this sculpture trio. The other thing that Oliver was wanted to convey was, is with distance comes perspective. To put, in our, put into context our problems on Earth and our conflicts on Earth. If you could view the Earth from Pluto, that tiny little four millimeter ball, 10 kilometers away, if you could view the Earth from the edge of the solar system, what would you see? You'd see a planet with no borders, just human beings trying to survive. And so the part of this project is to get people to think, and we heard it in the first talk about us and them, is to get people to think about them and us, then becomes with that cosmic perspective, becomes meaningless, it becomes trivial, becomes rather foolish to divide ourselves. Oliver has also created a a sculpture, a very large sculpture of the Earth, not, on, not on, the, on the scale, but a different separate sculpture at the start of the trail. It's about the size of the sun as well. It's about 2.3 2 meters. Um, on every, he's marked on every country on the Earth. There's a border for every country on the Earth. And there's two words which are illuminated, us and them in every country. And so those can light up as us, or they can light up as them. But the point is, the further you get away from the Earth, taking a cosmic perspective, us and them just become us. And so we want to communicate this, not just, not just the scientific stru structure of our, of our solar system, but to get people to think in that way, which I think is what the, one of the reasons you're all here, right, is that you don't want, you want um, divided societies, you don't want concepts that divide us, you want to, uh, we all want, uh, to think of ourselves as humans and uh, together and humanists on this planet to solve the problems uh, that we are facing, not having to go to Mars to escape the problems because it really is just a, uh, a, 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 an escape route that's probably not going to work. So I think this is the future of... Um, uh, I think this is, a, for me, this, I learned a lot in the, in the last year designing this with Oliver did the artistic design. I, I sort of just did the numbers and listened, listened to him and said, yes, that's, that's great, right? This looks fantastic, uh, but let's make sure the numbers are right. Um, but I learned a lot about how scientists and artists can work together um, for both the good of, um, of, of, of science and the good of humanity. Um, I think this is, but this is not a new concept. So it's not like we've invented this great relationship between art and, and science. This has been around for many years. I happen to be in the Royal Society this week, and I was shown the original uh, version of this, which still is stunning every time I see it. So here it is, published in 1664. Just to illustrate, we've been doing this for a long time, but we, we, we need to continue to do it. Micrographia by Robert Hooke, famous fellow of the Royal Society. Micrographia are some physiological descriptions of minute bodies made by magnifying glasses with observations and inquiries thereupon. And really what he did, he was just looked at tiny objects with a, with a microscope, the first microscope ever invented, and he drew this. I mean, absolutely stunning. 1664. This is a flea. This is what he saw, all hand uh, drawn. Uh, and so art, scientists have been inspired by art uh, for centuries, um, through both scientific investigation, through exploring the world, um, technology drove Western Europeans to develop timepieces and sextants that can measure the position of the sun. So if you can measure the position of the sun or a star and you can tell the time, you can position yourself anywhere on Earth and allow them to explore the Earth. And so we're doing similar things now in the solar system, trying to explore the solar system with technology. But we've been doing this for years. Um, of course, it hasn't always worked out. Uh, it hasn't always had the result looking back on how things developed. Captain Cook went to, was one of the pioneers, Western, um, modern Western 
governments, funded explorers, obviously exploited humanity where, when they went because they had greater technological power. We need to learn from that as we look to the future, as we're thinking, are we going to, are we going to colonize Mars? Are we, what are we going to do with this planet? I think we've got to learn from those mistakes. Yes, we, there, are, there are nations and there are countries and there are people who have greater technological prowess and ability than, than others, and we've got to do that in an ethical way. So I think science and art have to learn both from each, uh, from each other, and that's one of the lessons that I've I've, I've, I've really been reinforced uh, with me uh, over the last uh, year working on this project. Here's another one, for example, and I, I love looking at these old uh, etchings because these are you know, real explorers going and looking at new lands, trying to communicate that back, so making scientific discoveries, but trying to communicate that back to uh, both the people who funded them and the, uh, and the general uh, public. Uh, 1776, voyage to Mount Vesuvius, these are in the Royal Society archives as well. Fantastic drawing here from 1696 by Augusto, Augustino Silla, uh, who's drawn a shark, dogfish teeth, sea urchins. Uh, and the, in this paper, one of the very early scientific papers, just with these drawings and with this artistic work, trying to draw links between these objects. So I'll leave you with um, some thoughts about science, society, and humanism and why you're here. Um, the scientific process is also, as well as being inspired by art, it really is a bedrock of a cohesive democratic society. We want the scientific process to be embedded in, in our decision making, because if governments start to question that, and they start to invoke, what is the word, alternative facts, as we heard during the, one of the Trump, the Trump campaign, if governments try to undermine that, then it really is a threat to democracy. You know, if they're undermining the scientific truth of, say, climate change, or they're uncomfortable with the facts, it really is a threat to, to fundamentally to democracy. Um, the education system in the UK, given this, I think over the last year in particular, I've realized how important it is to educate our children more broadly. There's now some momentum within the, the academies in the UK, British Academy, Royal Society, to come up with a different education system so that children are not specializing in A-levels too early, but taking a broader educational approach. And I think that's going to be very important for, uh, for our society. Um, the education system in Northern Ireland, we've heard, is very narrow. It causes social division, not just the, uh, along the uh, religious lines, but we also still have a selection process at age 11. And effectively, you're testing children at 9 or 10 and dividing them in that way. It's not good. We're already dividing them by Protestants or Catholics, and then you're dividing them by Protestant secondary schools, Protestant grammar schools, Catholic secondary, and it's, it's, it's an extra division that I think we don't need, and I think we need to redesign, as we heard in the, in the first session, really redesign our education system. And I think finally, the positive thing, I think we as, hu as humanists and human beings can play a central role in this reform, as we heard in the first talk. So I hope I've, I've tried just to bring that back, so they relate the scientific um, uh, spirit of discovery that Meg talked about back to some of the really important issues we have in society. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. And if Meg is here, she'll come back on and we'll take any, take any questions from you. Shall we sit? <laughs> Hello, have I got a microphone? Oh, I say it's marvellous, isn't it? Um, your your um, uh, um, presentations were marvellous. I'm just reminded of, of, of that wonderful episode of Father Ted where he's explaining to Dougal about perspective and he says, Dougal, long, 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 long way um, away, small, closer, <laughs> big. And it just struck me that that's just wonderful. Thanks very much. Thank you. <laughs> I'm a big Father Ted fan as well. <laughs> yes, it's a compliment to be to be talked about in the uh, in the same. In the same. Like that as well, Thank you. <laughs> so I have a question about the second point on there that the uh, education system narrows too quickly. So if I think that. Discussion is that we might get rid of A levels and go to a baccalaureate thing where you have sort of six subjects instead of three. Yeah. So would you then would you need to add an extra year of university to the undergrad 
because let's say you're doing physics and now you get to university and you've only got half as much physics as you would have done before. Yes, I think so that's quite possible. And so that's also a conversation that's being had in, in um, uh, many universities uh, that we are selecting those who've selected A-levels, a the particular A-levels of that topic, and they've selected those at age 16. And we want to increase the diversity in our subjects. But already we are, we're up against that decision which has already been made and baked in. So we can't change those decisions at 16, whereas uh, or even at 15 where they've made those decisions. So there are conversations, and I was, at, I was in Cambridge recently, and they were having a same, the same conversation. Is a foundation year uh, a, a, a good idea, particularly if, the, if, the, if we move to this system? They're think, also thinking about it as they feel they may be missing out on talent who, are, who haven't made the choices that others make and maybe we're selecting from a certain group, certain population demographic. Uh, so yes, the conversations are happening in the uni in universities as well about what would happen if they went to that, if the if the schools went to that system, and how the universities would bridge that gap between baccalaureate and first year science. Yes, those conversations are happening, and I think it would would be necessary. Um, just a, a quick question: um, You mentioned that the there were a hundred billion galaxies in the universe, yeah, at least. I'm really confused because uh, recently there was a cosmologist on either radio or television who said the universe is infinitely large and there's an infinite number of galaxies. Yes. Can you um, give the definitive answer on this, uh, please? <laughs> so, uh, so the answer is no, I can't give the, the, the definitive answer. I'll give you an answer. <laughs> so so uh, yeah, when I say 100 uh, and 100 billion galaxies, that's the estimated number in the visible universe that we could detect uh, with current instrumentation. Um, so there may, there may well be, if the, if the universe is infinite, which, is, um, which mostly comes from the th a theory, which is based on how fast the, the universe is expanding. Uh, if it is, then the number is likely to be more, uh, but those galaxies would not yet, the light from those galaxies would not yet have reached us. So it's the 100, th the 100 uh, billion I give you is a, is a, is a lower limit, and it's possible, uh, possible or very likely that there are many more. But that's about the estimate of the, of the number in the visible universe that we can detect with current technology. Taking a somewhat wider perspective of these sorts of things, as indicated by what everybody can see on the thing, science, society, and humanism, um, there's a lot there that I agree with, uh, but there's an interesting impl implication. Uh, one of the most humanist scientists alive today is surely Carlo Raffelli, um, who has written a lot um, on science and a wide variety of other topics as well. He's a very, very widely read man. And in one of his essays, he says, he says, how is it that I have become so widely read so and widely informed? And it's because of the American educational system, uh, which he says, if you sign on for a three-year course, at a university, they don't have to be three consecutive years. And he said, it took me seven years to get fully qualified because I was in a position where for two of those years, not consecutive, I could afford to take a year off. And under the current educational system uh, in this country, uh, sorry, in the UK, mm -hmm. that's almost impossible to do. Yep. You sign on for a three-year course, and you have to do it in three years. Do you think um, that moving towards the American model of you do, you do it for three years, but not necessarily consecutive, is possible and desirable? Yeah. I'd be interested in a male's perspective <laughs> on this, having come through the I US am system. the product of the American uh, mm -hmm. education system. I would say it's, it's a... F um, Typically, university is four years. Um, it doesn't have to be consecutive, but one of the core requirements is that you take a common core curriculum in other areas. And so although I did physics, I had to take poli-sci. was actually by someone who had brokered the Good Friday Agreement, who was teaching at the University of Pennsylvania, and gave an incre incredibly interesting perspective I wouldn't have gotten 
had I not been forced to sit in that because that was not my choice, right? I had to pick and I was like, politics, poli sci sounds great. Um, you know, English literature, uh, music. And so I think what that does is it makes you a little bit broader than just sort of uh, narrowly focused. And so I think that having gap years and things that do, are in the US system are in some places, I think, now in the UK university system. But I think it's that narrow focus that it, I still am very shocked to that none of the you know, undergraduates at Queen's University of Belfast that do physics are required to take a reading or writing course. And I think those were some of the most important skills I learned on top of understanding the physics. And so I think there is maybe some benefit to that broadness and getting that appreciation and also that Again, if you're not a science major, right, in your philosophy or you're studying, you know, the arts, that you get that ability to have that appreciation and some understanding for science because it, it drives other things in our life, right? Imagine how different the pandemic responses may have been if people fully understood what exp exponential growth is. And probably many people in this room do, but I don't know if that was true for a lot of the, the, the populace, particularly in the U.S., um, and so I think there's something about that broadness that helps that um, even then, right, it still has implications that it didn't quite make sense to people in the states um, of, of exponential growth, even if they did take those courses. But I do think it helps broaden your perspective um, that may sometimes help. Uh, I am very fortunate um, in that I went to a university in this country uh, where to get your, your degree, you had to do two things. You had to pass your final examination, and you had to be there for three years. Those were independent. And like a number of other people, I, passed my, uh, I worked very hard for two years. I got my degree after two years, in the sense that I had passed my final examinations. Um, the third year, I could literally do whatever I wanted, as long as I fulfilled the residence qualification of being there for so many days in my third year. And without doubt, that was the most valuable th part of my whole university education, because for one year, I could study whatever I wanted to study, and it didn't have to be, there was no examination, as long as I had completed the residence. Um, I had to... I had to turn up for an examination. I didn't need to do anything other than write my name on the piece of paper to show that I had attended the examination. And so it was lovely, because I could study the things that I really wanted to study. Um, in, in my case, it was uh, philosophy. and uh, My first degree was mathematics, and then for a th year, I could study philosophy. My, my daughter uh, also attended this same university. She attended it as a medic. So for two years, she studied the uh, preclinical medicine. And in the third year, she studied um, anthropology. And I asked her afterwards, well, what did you get in your anthropology year? And she said, what I realized was that medicine is a social construct. And this opened her eyes to really what medicine was about. And I was wondering whether it would be possible in this country to achieve something like that, where the state at the university, plus uh, passing a final examination, were independent. I mean, I think it is it is possible. Um, I think it, it comes down to it comes down to cost, uh, really, and uh, and how and how universities are funded would be. It's I think it's an aspiration that we would like students to have that broad uh, education. But I think it does now come down to cost and uh, and fees and what students are prepared to pay. I think we've got time for one more because we're already at five past twelve. I think we have one more question and then and then we'll stop. Yes. I was just interested um, as to whether you've spoken to people who are religious and where they see God within this huge um, galaxy, mm -hmm. uh, st stratosphere, whatever you want to call it, I don't know what you call it, the, the, all these galaxies. Where do these, sorry? Oh. In the, anyway, 
have yeah. they spoken to you about it? And, yeah. and what do they see? Where is God yeah. within that? Because it must be mind blowing for them. Where they is very, he? Yeah, there's, there's a very wide, there's a wide range of views. Um, I think there are there are many um, very good scientists who are, who are religious, and they're able and they just separate the two. They have the scientific process. Um, they don't. It's not changed in any way. I don't see they don't write their papers in any different way. They don't review papers in any different way, and they're able to separate the two. Um, and they have a they have a view that that. I, well, I don't want to. I don't, I don't want to speak for them or what they. But my sense is they they think they they assume that God has created the universe in some way and it's come into being. Um, that, that there has been a hand, possibly a, you know a, a a hand in creating the universe. Um, but that the the laws, the scientific laws that we study, um, are are not then shaped in any way by that. And so they do. They are capable of keeping them completely separate. Um, uh, it's not a satisfactory answer for me, but I, I, I'm sort of paraphrasing what I, I, the, 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 the view that I think that they would, the answer that they would give you, I think, is that they're quite capable of separating them then, and they, for, for I, I don't know what the, 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 the real reason is for their belief, um, uh, but they, uh, they're quite capable of doing science in the same way as us without, um, without that being diluted. I think it's often the deist approach Right, so some of uh, my colleagues who are very devoted in their religion will say, God created the universe, but God created the laws of physics and doesn't intervene, right? And so, you know, again, a very deist approach. You can study everything, right? But there's not, a planet's not gonna move miraculously, right? And because that's not how gravity works. Um, but ultimately, you could argue that going back to the Big Bang, we don't know what happened before that. <laughs> we some have theories, right? But it also sort of sometimes fits in with that idea of theology. Whether that's right, for me, it's not. But for others, you know, that, that's a thing that fits well with there being a creator. So I think in some way, they can reconcile um, what we know about the universe. Doesn't, it doesn't seem to contradict religion in a way for them that causes a crisis. So I think it's a lot of the deist approach of you know, the laws of physics are the laws of physics because they're made that way. But whether there's a divine creator doing that, or if it's just the fact that we're living in a multiverse and we happen to be in the, the scenario with the, the pr parameters that allow that fundamentally, I don't know. Um, but maybe one day we'll, we'll, humanity will figure it out. Thanks, Meg. I think we'll stop there. Any local announcements uh, for the next session? Please go ahead. Thank you.